Hello everyone. Today I will talk about this interesting JMIA paper about a spatial temporal attention network for a pandemic prediction using real world evidence data. And this is a paper published on JMIA, uh, this very recent paper, and it's a, a joint work by Jun Yi Gao and uh, Rakshis Sharma, Cheng Tian, and Lucas Glass, and Jeffrey Spader. Uh, Justin Rumber, uh, myself, and uh, Danny Kaxiao. And it's a, a truly collaboration between uh, acad academia institution and uh, uh, industry. It's a joint work uh, from uh, Acuvia, Georgia Tech, Temple University, and uh, University of Illinois. So let's start it. So this COVID pandemics uh, definitely changed everybody's life. And, uh, and as, of, as of today, we can see the um, cumulated uh, COVID cases uh, has reached 115 million globally. And the uh, accumulated deaths has reached 2.5 million. And this is a curve uh, over time. And this is uh, information we got from the, uh, uh, this particular website from Johns Hopkins University. So if you want to do a build a predictive model and that can do early prediction of this pande pandemic outbreak, and that can help uh, policymakers to design better policy and also reduce uh, the cost associated. So what are the challenges associated with uh, pandemic prediction? There's quite a few. Uh, the first one uh, is about how to utilize this uh, spatial information to do better predictions. And most of the traditional epidemi epidemiology models actually build separate models for different locations. For example, they can build a model for uh, Chicago and a separate model for New York and another model for uh, Seattle and so on. So it, it doesn't incorporate spatial proximity. Uh, actually, intuitively speaking, spatial proximity really matters. And you can imagine uh, if nearby location have a lot of uh, COVID cases and it may affect your location as well because you're close to that region. And not only spatial proximity matters, we can also consider other type of uh, interaction. For example, population movements, demographic similarity, right? maybe uh, two sim uh, cities may have a similar uh, pandemic patterns, like Chicago and New York may have a similar behaviors, and two rural county may have a similar behaviors. So that's the first challenge. And the second challenge is about how do we incorporate more reliable data? And traditional models heavily rely on the case report data. So we all know those are uh, can be underreported, especially when the pandemic is just happening. A lot of those uh, reporting data may be uh, unreliable. And there could be a latency of those reports. And however, there are other type of data may be more reliable, such as uh, the real world evidence data, like medical claims data. There are, uh, widely available and could be very comprehensive and uh, uh, more accurate. So that's the second challenge. Can we incorporate other type of data to make a better prediction? And the third one is, how do we choose the right model? Right? And most of the pandemic prediction depends on those epidemiology models, such as uh, SIR and SEIR. And this stands for uh, susceptible, exposed, infectious, and recovery. So that's the SEIR model. It, it has a lot of benefit. Uh, for one thing, it has a very few parameters. So if you don't, even you don't have a lot of data, you can fit uh, uh, this type of epidemiological models very well. And uh, however, the, this type of model, because it only have a very few parameters, it can is unable to capture very complex short-term patterns such as uh, super infections, time variance, uh, infectivities, and so on. Right? Those uh, very subtle and complex patterns uh, would not be captured by this type of model. On the other hand, there are data-driven models such as uh, deep learning-based models using uh, you, such as LSTM, GRU. They are good to model sequential data. However, they only can predict known data patterns and usually for short-term predictions. And so uh, maybe we can combine them, right? That's where this work comes in. It pro they propose this model called STEM that incorporate both the epidemiological model as the regularization and also leveraging deep learning models so that we can build uh, accurate models by leveraging large amount of data. 
And in terms of the, the model itself, it has a, a few steps. First, it constructs this graph, uh, location-based graph, based on uh, location similarity, some static feature about those locations, and also the dynamic features at those locations over time. And then they fed such graph into a graph neural network called graph attention network or GAT model and to learn a representation for each location. Then those representation will be the input for a, a gated recurring uh, unit model, or this RNN based model to make prediction for new cases and recovery cases and some uh, epidemiology model parameters. Uh, and then they combine two different loss function, the prediction loss and uh, this uh, uh, SIR constraints. And that's the kind of the entire model. So let's uh, go through this model, uh, different components of the model in more details. For the graph construction, so they, they construct this uh, uh, this graph or attributed graph, and that represent this both static feature and dynamic feature. A static feature include, uh, so first of all, each node on this graph corresponding to a location. So there could be a, a county level graph and or state level graph, right? Each node will correspond to a county or a state. Then for each node, uh, it has uh, some static feature, the location of the, uh, I mean, the geolocation of that uh, node and the population size and the density uh, of that location. Right? Uh, then there are some dynamic feature. Those are features uh, can change over time, uh, including a uh, number of COVID related diagnoses and the number of uh, hospitalization at that location and the number of COVID cases. So those are the dynamic features, right? Those are all the features associated with, with each location. Then they construct this edge, right? So this edge is edge weight is uh, proportional to the population size of this two location, right? Location I and J, as well as the distance, right? So inverse to the distance. And then alpha, beta, and gamma, those are hyperparameters will be set uh, by, uh, by the algorithm. So that's the graph construction. And the second step is uh, to kind of build this neural network. It has the two uh, layers. One is this graph attention network layer. Uh, the, I mean, the, the purpose of this GAT model is to extract spatial relationships among different locations. And so the input feature, which, which are those features we have described, both static and uh, dynamic features. And then uh, it passed through this uh, graph neural network and to uh, GAT to get uh, embeddings for each location. And then those embeddings will be passed through another uh, neural network module called uh, gated recurrent unit or GRU to extract the temporal patterns. And finally, the output uh, of the neural networks are those uh, uh, predicted uh, cases, delta R, oh, sorry, de delta I, and the predicted recovered uh, cases, delta R. And so these are the two output that we really care about. Then in addition, we also have uh, two other output, gamma, beta. Those are uh, disease transmission rate and recovery rate that will be used to add the uh, epidemiological model into this neural network. And next, we can look at the uh, how the loss function is formed. And there are two different part of loss function. And the first one is this prediction loss. That's pretty standard for a regression type of model. And we're essentially measuring the predicted uh, number of infection, uh, infectious cases, right? Number of COVID cases and uh, subtract the real number of cases at this location at that time. So this is a square loss on that. Then similarly for the recovery cases, right? Number of uh, predicted recovery cases uh, subtract the, the true uh, recovery cases. And so that's a prediction loss. And then we also have this uh, uh, physical constraint or this constraint uh, by the SRR model. Once we have the beta and gamma, uh, and those are the model parameter for the SRR model, we can use the SRR differential equation to estimate the number of infectious infect, infected cases and the recovered cases. So those will be the model estimation if we use a SIR model. And that will be used as additional regularization to our prediction. So we want this um, uh, SIR model predicted cases to be similar to what the neural network actually predicted. And so that's kind of a bringing additional regularization 
to the overall model. But of course, this is only done at the training phase. During, I mean, at the test case, uh, test phase or inference time, we only use the neural network model to make the prediction. So, and this SIR model will not be used uh, in the inference time. So let, now let's look at the experiment. In the data set, uh, we're using a data set that coming from the Johns Hopkins uh, University and the, the, the COVID Resource Center. And so that's the, where we got the day-to-day -day statistics at different locations. And also we use the medical claims data from IQVIA. So there we have uh, over half, a, close to half a million patients uh, across 48 states. And next, the, some detailed setting. And this work is done uh, earlier last year, uh, mid last year. So we're using uh, March 22nd to May 17th data as uh, the training data, then we test the performance of the model uh, in the next uh, 20 days, right after May 17th. And uh, we conduct the prediction on uh, 45 states because uh, at that time, uh, there's only, uh, I think we, we have a threshold of 1,000 confirmed cases to be considered. I mean, if it's below 1,000, they're not included, included in this uh, uh, experiment. So we have 45 states and 193 counties right there. They already have over a thousand cases at each of those uh, locations. And the metric we're using are uh, mean squared errors, mean absolute error, and this uh, concordance correlation coefficients. And in all those uh, cases, uh, MSE and MAE, the lower the better, and uh, this uh, concordance correlation, the higher the better. So let's look at the state level prediction result. And this table shows the performance uh, when we predict 20 days in advance, right? So we want to predict next 20 days, for each of those 20 days, what are the number of uh, infected cases, a uh, new COVID cases at all those locations and in terms of MSE, MAE, and CCC. So you can see that uh, compared to uh, uh, this different baseline model, SIR, SEIR, those are epidemiological models or compare, also compared to some neural network models, such as uh, um, a GRU model. There's, uh, there's two different models it's specifically designed for COVID data, COLA GNN and uh, COVID GNN. And we also have a, a, a set of a few variation of our method, STEM, uh, without the uh, physical constraint or without the epidemiological models, and the STEM without the graph neural network and the full STEM model. So you can see the STEM model performed the best right, in, in significantly improve over uh, all the baseline, right? In, in fact, in terms of best baseline, we're improving over 48% uh, uh, lower in terms of MSE uh, and for this 20 days prediction. And you can also see the variation of our uh, different STEM model. And right? this, uh, without the graph neural network, the performance actually uh, drops quite a bit. So this uh, location proximity is very important in making a good prediction. And also the, the uh, epidemiological constraint, it's also fairly important, not, not as important as the location proximity, but still uh, it, it has a, a significant impact um, adding that the performance uh, improves. So that's the state level prediction. And we also did this for the county level prediction. I mean, sim similar uh, observation uh, you can see that uh, across, I mean, compared to all the baselines we're significantly better. And all the three different variations, I mean, the full stand model significantly outperformed the others. So in terms of the overall improvement, it's over 55% lower MSE uh, for a 20 days prediction and similar performance uh, for 15 days and, uh, and a little bit less, per, I mean, performance gain when we do a very short term prediction, right? five, five days, for example. So we can see some example uh, prediction plot right, for uh, 15 days, or I think, and you can see that um, here, the blue curve is the STEM prediction, the red cross uh, crosses, those are the actual uh, ground truth number of cases each day at California and Massachusetts. You can see that the, the blue curve is very close to the red crosses. So that means uh, we, the model is, uh, the STEM model performed really well. I mean, comparing to the other two baselines, uh, SIR, SEIR, I mean, those baseline I mean, predict much worse, especially for this longer term prediction. And we also give you another example 
for the county level prediction, you can see that for, for two different county, much smaller uh, number of cases, <coughs> you can still see a big improvement. And in our case, the STEM model performed very accurately. The blue curve, sorry, blue crosses and the red curve, the blue curve and the red crosses are, are matches very well. Um, <coughs> and the baseline performed much worse. Okay, so in summary, uh, this paper talked about a spatial temporal attention network model for pandemic prediction using real world uh, evidence data. And if you're, you want to try out this model, the code are, are, can be downloaded from this link. And thank you very much.